Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth lecture of the third module, which is on inverter design and analysis. So in the last lecture, we were looking at you know the BTC of this MOSFET based and MOSFET based inverter, which had a resistor as its load. The disclaimers for this lecture also remain the same. In this lecture, since we have already looked at BTC, how exactly you know uh, we kind of approximate or we kind of analyze or predict what exactly is you know the operating regime of the MOSFET. And accordingly, we use appropriate expressions for the drain current and calculate the values of you know VOL, VOH, VM, VIL, VIH, and so on. So now that we know all these things about the VTC, let us discuss about its power dissipation and the delay. So in the power dissipation, let us first look at the static power dissipation. So what exactly is static power dissipation? We discussed it you know in the previous lectures as well. So static power dissipation occurs. When your output is static or when your output is fixed at logic level high or logic level low. So let us look at what exactly is the static power dissipation in this circuit. And I would be giving a generalized expression, which could be then extended for this circuit. So first to analyze static power dissipation, we need to also you know, know what exactly is the fraction of time for which the output is in logic zero state. And what's the fraction of time in which the output is in logic one state. If the power dissipation, if the static power dissipation is different when the output is at logic level zero and when the output is at logic level one, we need to know for what fraction of time the output is at logic level one and what for what fraction of time the output is at logic level zero. So let us assume for the time being that V out is logic zero or one with probability P V out equals to zero and P V out equals to one respectively. So in general, in digital circuits, uh, what we do is we represent this P V out equals to zero, which is the fraction of time or the probability that the output is zero as al alpha zero. Also, we represent probability that the output is one or a fraction of the time for which the output is one as alpha one. Now, what does this alpha zero and alpha one depend on? So alpha zero and alpha one, their values basically depend upon the input. What exactly is the probability of input being logic zero or logic one? And also it depends on the logic gate. So let's take the case of a simple inverter, right? So let's take the case of a simple inverter. Let's say that it, its input can be logic zero or logic one with a probability equals to 50%. That is half of the time the input is zero, half of the time the input is one, which is like, you know, a duty cycle of 50% that we ideally want. So the output corresponding to this will also be, you know, half of the time it will be high, half of the time it will be low. So alpha zero equals to alpha one equals to half for an inverter where the input is kind of, you know, uh, having a duty cycle of 50% or you know, input is also having a transition probability of 50%. Now let's take the case of a NAND gate, let's say. So in NAND gate, there are two inputs. Let's say the two inputs are input A and input B. And let's say even the inputs are ideal, that is the probability of input A being like high or logic one or logic zero is 50%. And the probability of input B being logic level high or logic level low is also 50%. So probability of inputs being high or low is 50%, that is half. So the output of a NAND gate is one for three cases, right? When A equals to B equals to zero, when A equals to one, B equals to zero, when A equals to zero, B equals to one. However, the output is zero only when A equals to one and B equals to one simultaneously for a NAND, right? So now the probability of input A and B both being one is simply given by probability A equals to one multiplied by probability B equals to one. So probability A equals to one is half and probability that B equals to one is half. So multiplication be one by four, right? So the probability that the output of the NAND gate is one is like, let's just reverse of this. So the probability that the output is zero of a NAND gate is simply probability that the input is A is one and the probability multiplied by the probability that input B is one. So those two probabilities are half half and therefore the overall probability becomes one by four. So probability, that your output of this NAND gate is zero, that is one by four. And what is the probability that the output is one? So that becomes one minus one by four, that is three by four, right? So that is how we can calculate this alpha zero and alpha one values for a NAND gate. So it depends upon, you know, both the inputs, the probability of inputs, as well as the kind of logic gate that we are implementing. Alpha zero and alpha one values are pretty important while calculating you know the transition properties or the switching activity of the output and that is very important when we are discussing you know the dynamic power dissipation so with that let me just talk about you know static power dissipation 
or the average static power dissipation of circuits. That is the usual thing that we talk about. So the average static power dissipation is nothing, but you know, uh, simply given by alpha zero, that is the fraction of time for which it is output is at logic level low, multiplied by the static power dissipation when the V out is VOL or the nominal logic level low. And we add to it alpha one, that is the fraction of time for which the output is one into P static, V out equals to VOH, that is when the output is nominal logic level high. Now let us look at this circuit. So for this circuit, since there is a resistor and there's a current flowing through this ID or IR, whatever you call it, because both are same. So what exactly happens? It will always dissipate this I square R or V square by R kind of a power, right? So let us just uh, write expression for that. So P static average in this case simply becomes VDD because you know one terminal is always fixed at VDD. So it's V times I, right? Power is VI. So VDD times the I. IR. So what is IR? IR is VDD minus VOL by RL when V out equals to VOL. That is for alpha at zero time, it's V out is equals to VOL. And therefore it's VDD by RL into alpha zero VDD minus VOL. This is for logic level low. And when the logic level is high, it's simply alpha one times VDD minus VOH because VOH is now V out, right? For output logic level high. However, you see that, you know, for this case, we found out that V out is like, V out or VOH is VDD, right? So when the V out or VOH is VDD, then this term ceases to zero. So this circuit kind of dissipates static power only when output is logic level low. Not at output, not when the output is at logic level one, that is VOH, that is V out equals to VOH equals to VDD. And when V out is logic zero, that is the output is at logic level zero, then the static power dissipation can be simply given by, you know, average P static, which is VDD by R alpha zero, which is the fraction of time for which the output is at logic level zero multiplied by VDD minus VOL. So this is simply VDD into VDD minus VOL by R which is the current R I R when V out equals to VOL and then multiplied by the like, fraction of time for which this V out is in logic level zero. Now the static power dissipation is significantly high. And, you know, we don't have only one inverter, one such inverter in the circuit. Each IC can consist of several inverters, maybe even millions or billions of such inverters. So if there are some billions or millions of such implementations on the circuit, then this power static power dissipation gets multiplied by that amount, right? And therefore the average static power dissipation of the IC, when we make it using this implementation is pretty high. It's pretty huge. So that is one of the motivations while going for, you know, a dynamic resistance load here or MOSFETs as a load. That is also one of the aspects apart from the size. Now with this discussion about static power dissipation, let us go ahead and look at the dynamic power dissipation. So for dynamic power dissipation, as I told you, we always assume this load capacitor at the output, right? Because now we are talking about switching power, right? Transition of output from zero to one and one to zero. All that you know, the power is consumed from the supply only when this output is transitioning from logic level zero to logic level one. And why so? Because then only some amount of charge is taken from the supply and then dumped onto this, right? Dumped onto this capacitor. So in that case, what exactly is, you know, the probability of transitioning of this output from zero to one? So if we know the probability that the output is zero, and if you know the probability that the output is one, probability of the output transitioning from zero to one is simply probability that the output is zero multiplied by the probability that the output is one, right? In the same order. So the probability of output transitioning from logic zero to logic one, that is PV out equals to zero going to PV out equals to one or V out equals to one is simply P that V out equals to zero into P that V out equals to one. It can be simply written as, you know, alpha zero to one, that is the switching activity of this output from zero to one is simply alpha zero multiplied by alpha one, where alpha zero is the probability that the output is at logic level zero and alpha one is the probability that the output is at logic level one. Now let us also take into account the frequency of the clock what we typically say is that circuit is synchronized with that clock, right? So this clock is feeding this as the input. So in that case, every time the clock goes, so what exactly is the like uh, transition frequency of this? So it's simply F times alpha zero to one. So what is the frequency with which this is transitioning? It's simply F multiplied by alpha zero to one. And now the dynamic power dissipation is simply given as P dynamic as alpha zero to one, that is the transition probability from zero to one multiplied by CL 
multiplied by VDD into V swing when the V swing is not VDD, which is VOH minus VOL. So here it becomes VDD minus VOL multiplied by F. So this is, you know, since it is kind of, you know, uh, taking power from the supply every time it is being switched. So what is the switching frequency? It's F into alpha zero to one. And then multiplied by the switching frequency, we have CL VDD V swing, which is kind of the power dissipated in one, one kind of alpha zero to one, like zero to one transition. So CL VDD V swing is the energy consumed from the supply in one transition. And if you multiply it with F alpha zero to one, that is frequency of the clock multiplied by the switching activity, then you kind of find the average switching frequency of this output going from zero to one. Now for this circuit, what exactly happens in general is the static power average is quite high as compared to dynamic power. And you don't really want static power, right? Because once the output is at logic level zero or output is at logic level one, you don't want the circuit to dissipate any energy or any power. However, when it is switching, you can tolerate some amount of power. I mean, even that power is kind of uh, undesirable, but when you are switching, you are kind of doing something. You are doing something with the circuit. But when you are at stable logic one or stable logic zero, you're kind of extracting no new information from the circuit. And therefore the power dissipator at that point of time is useless. So the static power dissipation is kind of useless, or I would say it's highly undesirable. Therefore, what is what people tried to do was since it's this active element, sorry, it's in this, it's this passive element RL, which is kind of dissipating this as heat whenever the current is passing through it. So what they tried to do is they tried to, you know, replace this static RL or this passive RL with the help of dynamic MOSFET based, uh, you know, dynamic MOSFET based, MOSFET based switches, where this is also a function of, you know, uh, you know, I would say the input. And it doesn't dissipate static power when the output is at stable logic one or stable logic zero. So this was one of the major motivation while going ahead for you know uh, some dynamic implementation of RL as well as MOSFET based implementation of RL. Now this was all about the power. Now let us move on and discuss about you know the delay. So for calculating the delay, let us first discuss about you know the TPLH and TPHL parts because those are the components by which we can characterize the propagation delay TP. So let us first look at evaluation of TPLH for this circuit. So what we do typically for evaluation of TPLH, I already told you that you know we apply or we assume step input has been applied. Obviously, in real world, it won't be step input. It will be input with a finite slope, finite t, t rise, t fall, and because of that finite rise and fall time, because of the finite slope, and not an infinite gain or not an infinite slope like this. Because of that finite slope, we'll have some you know leakage power dissipation there also. We'll discuss that when we'll discuss about CMOS inverter. But uh, let us here assume that you know the input is a step input. So what we are doing is we are calculating TPLH. So TPLH is simply you know low to high transition of output. So for low to high transition of output, we should give high to low transition of input. And we say that for T less than zero, we have the out we have the input at logic level one. And immediately after t equals to zero, we have input at logic level zero. So if you look at the output transition, it looks something like this. So you have you know this curve looking like you know charging of a capacitor, the output curve. So what happens here? Just after the transition, I mean t equals to zero plus that is here. What happens? V in becomes V O L. So zero is typical nominal level low, which is V O L. And here we assume that VOL is less than VT, right? So VOL, VOL is less than VT, this transistor is in cut off, and as such, this output is logic level high. And what happens? Basically, no current flows through it in the cutoff. That is what we assume. I mean, for T greater than zero, T dash greater than zero over here, we assume that you know, since this is at VOL and VOL is less than VTH of this transistor, therefore the transistor M1 is in cutoff and ID is equals to zero. Is that a fair assumption? No. Subthreshold current always flows through it, but the amount of subthreshold current is pretty low. It's in some pico amps or something. So we can assume for the time being that you know the drop across this MOSFET is pretty small, and as such, or the charge discharging current is pretty small, which flows through this. So we can assume that you know uh, in the steady state or in the quasi-static case, I would say this is close to VDD. It's not exactly; it won't be exactly VDD because some amount of discharging current is also there. But it would be very close to VDD since this discharging current is pretty small. It's subthreshold current close to some pico amps. Still, uh, in you know the modern technologies, this cannot be neglected. But here, 
uh, you know, for first-hand calculation, because what, what we are interested in is first-hand calculations, right? We are more interested in benchmarking different circuits to know which design is better and to see how the designs have evolved over time. So for that, even this assumption that ID equals to zero is perfect. Now let us see what happens. So once this is in cutoff, I mean, once this ID equals to zero, this is kind of open circuit, right? So what happens? This VDD charges this CL through this RL. So CL will be charged to VDD through RL for T greater than zero. So it closely resembles, you know, RC charging circuit. I mean, the curve would also resemble an exponential kind of charging curve. And we'll have a situation like this. So for T equals to zero, sorry, T greater than zero, we'll have this output capacitor being charged by this. And then in this case, how can you calculate TPLH? We found out that, you know, TPLH is simply 0.69 RLCL which is the time taken for this exponential curve to reach 50% of the output, right? So that is how we characterized TPLH. Now, since we have done this TPLH, here calculation of TPHL is not that trivial. I mean, in TPHL, there are these two circuits. I mean, this is sourcing and this is sinking current. So there are two of these phenomena happening together. So before going on to, you know, see how basically we can evaluate TPHL, let us look at time evolution of V out when you know our input goes from 0 to 1. So TPHL means your output is going from high to low or the input is going from 0 to 1 if it is an inverting circuit. So let us look at what exactly happens to the V out or how exactly the V out evolves as a function of time when you have input of this like input of this inverter or input of this MOSFET going from 0 to 1. Here also we assume a step input. So T dash equals to zero. Before that, it's VOL. That is the transistor is in cutoff. So output is one. Immediately after this T dash equals to zero, what happens? This becomes VO, V in becomes VOH. So VOH here is VDD. So once this becomes VDD, you know, this transistor starts to discharge some current. So some amount of charge through this capacitor is discharged. So here, some amount of charge is flowing, flowing to the ground. And also at the same time, VDD is trying, trying to charge it. So these two phenomena are counteracting each other and therefore it kind of discharges or the voltage reduces here. But, uh, you know, because of these two phenomena happening together, this voltage will reach a steady state only at t equals to infinity. So this VOL is reached only at t equals to infinity because this discharging process will continue infinitely and then charging is also being done at the same time. So because of that, this gets stabilized at a particular point only at t equals to infinity. And if you look at this curve, I mean, if you look at this curve, it's not perfectly exponential. I mean, uh, there would be some kind of uh, other dependence as well. I mean, there would be some amount of uh, deviation from the exp true exponential curve because this transistor is not an ideal current source, but the current through it will also fluctuate depending upon VDS, right? So as the, as you know, uh, the voltage across this V out decreases. So, you know, the transistors operating regime also changes and hence the current through it will change. So because of that, what happens? This is not perfectly exponential, but it deviates slightly from the exponential value. So now let us look at how the transistor behaves once this kind of transition is happening uh, at its output. That is once its PDS is changing. So let us look at this output characteristics of the transistor and let me open my pen. So initially at t less than zero, that is t equals to zero minus, what we had is we had v in equals to logic level zero or nominal level low, or it was less than vt. So if it was less than vt, our transistor was following this curve, right? The output characteristics was following this curve, like close to the axis. And we were at this point, point one. So here, what exactly is there? v in equals to vol, v out equals to vos, that is vdd. So here we are we out equals to VOH, that is the drain voltage of this, and our VGS is less than VTM, so we are on this curve. And we were at this point. Now immediately, immediately after you know the step input is applied, what happens? The output transitions from so the input transitions from where to where? The input transitions from VOL to VOH. So now instead of traversing this line, which is VGS equals to uh, VOL less than VTM, we will be traversing this line. VGS equals to V in equals to VOH. So immediately from one to two, because of this application of step input, we move from point one to point two. And now once we move from point, point one to point two, this current starts to flow. I mean, this value of current starts to flow through this transistor and it starts to discharge the CL. 
So as the CL discharges, what happens? The voltage across this capacitor decreases. That is how VDS decreases. So we start to follow this curve. Right? We start to follow this curve. What we are more interested in? We are more interested in this point for calculation of TPHL. We are interested in this point three, where our output goes to, you know, uh, V swing by two or half of VOH plus VOL, right? So where the output goes, fifty percent. That is the point for, uh, for which we calculate TPHL, right? So this is the point which is of more interest to us. Now transition from two to three happens at T equals to TPHL. Now from three to four. That is from this to you know step like uh, achieving a stable value of VOL that takes almost infinity amount of time, like infinite amount of time. So to reach this point four, which represents the VOL, it will take you know around infinite amount of time, or it takes forever. So let me just you know uh, let me just kind of summarize this for you. So initially t less than t zero, we are having V equals to VOL. And what is VOL? VOL is typically less than VTH. So we are traversing this curve, and we are at point one. Immediately, once the step is applied, what happens? It becomes one, right? So our input becomes like our input becomes V equals to VOH. So we are starting. We go here instantaneously, almost instantaneously, because we are applying a step input. And then what happens? This current, this amount of current starts to flow through that load capacitor. It discharges, you know, this capacitor. As this load capacitor discharges, the voltage across it changes. Once it goes to 50%, then this time is kind of called your TPHL, what we usually define as TPHL. And then from three to four, that is going from 50% to you know this stable value of VOL, it takes almost forever. So to you know just summarize again, what we have is. At T dash less than zero, that is when the input is VOL, which is less than you know VTH. We have our circuit at this operating point one. Our transistor is operating at point one, and then the output is simply VOH, that is VD. Now, the moment we apply this T dash, like T dash equal to zero plus, we apply this step input, and it becomes V equals to you know V equals to one or VOH. So V equals to VOH. Now we move to this point. We will start traversing this. However, at this point, you should note that you know it has not just discharged; it hasn't got time to discharge, and therefore the output remains at VOH or VD. Now, T equals to fifty percent. That is, once we have traversed half of the swing. So what we have traversed is VOH minus VOH minus VOL by two, which is half of VOH plus VOL. Why this half of VOH plus VOL? Because we were at VOH, and then we have traversed half of the output swing, which is VOH minus VOL by two. VOH minus VOL is the output swing, so VOH minus VOL by two, that is the half of the output swing, and VOH minus of this term, VOH minus VOL by two, that gives you half of VOH plus VOL, and that is something which is you know uh, this midpoint three. So we reach three, the which we call at you know we call as TPHL, and at three the output is half of VOH plus VOL. See, we have traversed the voltage which is VOH minus VOL by two. That is, we have gone half the swing, but the drain voltage at that point is half of VOH plus VOL, and that is your V out value. And in order to go from this value to you know VOL, it takes almost forever. Or at T dash equals to infinity, we can expect that we will reach the static value of VOL. Now, with this information about you know the time evolution of V out, let us go ahead and estimate the PHL. So how can we estimate TPHL? So I'll be telling you two approaches. You can use either one of them because both of them give you some close to accurate results. Since you are talking about first-hand, you know, estimations and you know, uh, approximations, so they give you close to the same order of magnitude result, not the exact results. That's for sure. So let us first look at you know, first approach for estimation of TPHL, which is based on charge and which which is based on kind of discharging of this load capacitor. I mean, uh, which is calculated using the charge which has been taken away from this capacitor divided by the current which is discharging. Q equals to I times T, or uh, your T is equals to simply Q by I. So that is what people use. So here also we will assume step input, and again every other assumption is same. I mean, uh, just before the transition it is at VOL. And immediately after the transition, it is at VOH. That is, V is at VOH, and therefore 
we'll start traversing this curve, right? So we are here initially, and then we go to this point two, and then we start to transition this. We start to you know follow this curve for our MOSFET. No. If V is equals to VOH, now we are on at this. We are for T greater than zero. What happens? We are having the characteristics of M1 on this curve. VJ equal, VJ is equals to VDD or VJ is equals to VOH and VDS. And this point, let's call it as VDS2, ID2. And then it, when it travels half of the voltage swing, that is half of VOH minus VOL, then it reaches this point three where the voltage is VDS3, current is IDS3. So let us first talk about this point two. So as we discussed on calculation of VOH and VOL, so what exactly we do? We try to you know uh, find out what exactly is the operating regime of this MOSFET, right? So let us talk about the operating regime of this MOSFET when M1 is at point two. So at point two, your VGS is VOH, that is VDD. Your VDS is also VOH, that is VDD. Since VDS equals to VDD. Equals to VGS, therefore VDS is greater than VGS minus VT, and hence this is at saturation at point two. So in, since it's at saturation at point two, and VDS two is equals to VOH, that's one fact that we know now. Let's talk about the operating regime when the transistor reaches this point three. So here I would like to mention that this analysis, what we are doing, is true for long channel MOSFETs. I mean, the method is true even for short channel MOSFETs in velocity saturation mode, but the operating regime may change. So that I'll discuss towards the end of this lecture. But right now, let us assume that this has been done for long channel MOSFET, where VD sat is simply VGS minus VTH, and it's not dictated by velocity saturation. So at VDS three, we have this like at this point three, we have this VDS three and ID three. So at this point three, our VDS is half of VOH plus VOL. Or VGS is VOH that is VDD. So clearly here, half of this VOH plus VOL is less than VGS minus VT. Therefore, our transistor is a linear region. See, this is something that we are assuming. But always, when you assume something at the end of the day, you, you should put the values, you should find the values following this assumption and check if it is actually correct. Here, we are sure that you know half of VOH plus VOL that is less than VDD minus VT. VT is typically 0.2 to 0.1 VDD, so it's less than this. So this value is less than VGS minus VT, and as such, we can say that it's in linear region. And our VDS3 is nothing but half of VOH plus VOL because we have traversed half of the voltage swing, or the output is half of the value. This that is this one. Now let us calculate this TPH. So in going from 0.2 to 0.3, that is in going from here to here, 50%. What is the kind of charge? Which has moved out of CL. So the charge which has moved out of CL is simply Q discharged, and that is nothing but 0.5 CL VOH minus VOL. How we get to this? So it's simply CL times change in the voltage. So what is the change in the voltage? The voltage goes from this VOH to half of VOH plus VOL. That is we have traversed half of the swing. That is half into CL into VOH minus VOL. So that is the charge which has moved out of this load capacitor. Now, what is the current that is discharging this? The current which is discharging this is simply the current which is flowing through the transistor minus the current which is supplied by this resistor, right? Because the resistor tries to uh, kind of charge it, and transistor or MOSFET tries to discharge it. So the effective current which is discharging is simply the current drain current of the MOSFET minus the current through the resistor. Now let us look at what exactly happens, or what exactly is the magnitude of this discharge current. Immediately after you know you apply this step input, so immediately after that you apply this step input, your drain current of the MOSFET is at VDS2 ID2. That is your drain current is ID2, and what is the uh, like current through the resistor? Resistor current is simply IR0 plus. Now the drain current through the resistor is no sorry the current through the resistor is simply VDD minus this V out by R. So at this point zero plus our V out was also VDD that is VOH. So VDD minus VDD, so this becomes zero. So at this part, we have our ID two as 0.5 kN VOH minus VT square by two, or like kN VOH minus VT square by two because this is in saturation at 0.2, and our VGS is nothing but VOH, right? So this is the current drain current at zero plus, 
and ir0 plus is 0 because voh is vdd which is same as you know the difference the potential difference across this register is same potential difference is actually zero since the potential across the terminals is same and because of that your ir0 plus is zero so ids ids that is i discharge zero plus is simply the current through this mosfet at saturation when your bg is nothing but voh or vdd now let us look at what is a discharge current at t equals to 50% that is when your output voltage has traversed half of the voltage swing so in that case your transistor is or mosfet is in point 3 so it's in the linear regime and the current that flows through it is id3 and subtracting through that we'll have to subtract the charging current which is the current flowing through the flowing through the uh, resistor so that is ir t equals to 50% So here, IRT equals to fifty percent. We have this VDS three, which is point uh, five VOH plus VOL. So, what is the difference between these two? VDD minus half of VOH plus VOL, which is half of VOH minus VOL, since your VOH is close to VDD and VOH is VDD itself. So, your ID three here in the linear region that becomes PN VGS. So, VGS is simply you know your VO VOH here, VOH minus VT. VDS three minus VDS three square by two, so that that has been missed here. So it would be uh, VDS three square by two, and IR equals to simply VDD minus VDS three by RL. And we know VDS three, right? We know that VDS three is half of VOH, so it's half of VOH plus VOL. So by putting these values, now we have to you know rely on approximation. So what we are doing is, since you know these points are not differing much in terms of the current. what we are taking is we are just assuming that the average current that flows through it i mean the average discharging current that flows during this interval is simply the average of these two points i mean it's a huge approximation but this works fine only when this point 2 and 3 the current at point 2 and point 3 doesn't change much otherwise also if it is changing by slightly more amount also this is a fair assumption i mean this is an approximation it's just to give you a first hand calculation right it's just to give you order of magnitude so if you just are interested in the order of magnitude then this approximation works perfectly fine even if you know the current is changing much but here this assumption gives you close to correct values because they are quite same i mean they are the current doesn't change much in going from point 2 to point 3 and hence this i discharge average that is taking the arithmetic mean of i discharge at 0 plus and i discharge at t equals to 50% that is at this instance and this instance that kind of gives you close to the accurate results so this is a fair assumption here however if this 3 is pretty much down here then it doesn't work fine i would say that you know it will give you far off result but the order of magnitude will still be preserved so that way this assumption is fine now once you know this average discharge current in going from you know vdd equals to like vds equals to voh to vds equals to half the voltage swing i mean uh, so in traversing from in traversing the half the logic swing that is when the output becomes half so this is the discharge current average discharge current for that and once we know the average discharge current and we know the charge which has flown out of the load capacitor we can calculate the time and how can we calculate the time it could be simply q discharged by i discharge average so I told Q is equals to I times T, so Q by I will simply give you TPHL. So here you can approximately obtain TPHL as the charge which has flown out of this load capacitor in going from T equals to zero to T equals to fifty percent divided by the discharge current or the average discharge current. Average discharge current when the current like when the current goes from like the current at zero plus to current at T equals to fifty percent. That is ID two to ID three. so this is how you can calculate tphl this is one of the ways of calculating tphl now let me go to another method and for that let me you know tell you a generalized method how you can kind of you know analyze or find out the equivalent resistance uh, during the transient response analysis of any kind of you know mosfet so to make our life simpler what we typically try to do is we try to model the time varying resistance of the mosfet as a linear and constant resistance are equivalent so why it's time varying resistance because the current actually changes you know as the output load capacitor discharges what happens the drain voltage of this mosfet changes and because of that the current kind of changes however what we are interested in we are interested in only the range or the time for which the output reduces by half right the output reduces by half of the swing 
or this reduces by half of the value or it goes from VAD to VAD divide. So that is typically what is uh, the region which is more interesting to us. However, you can extend this analysis to any other time instance as well. And it gives you fairly accurate results. I would say if the drain current doesn't change in that particular interval of time, then it gives you fairly accurate result. But if it changes significantly, for instance, if it changes from here to here, then you will get some amount of deviation. However, the order of magnitude will remain kind of same. So what we do is we kind of average the value of the resistance over the operating regime of interest. Here we are interested only in these points because of the typical definition of the propagation delay, going from half of the input to half of the output. Since input is a step function, it's only related to half of the output stream. So what we do is we either take the average value of the resistance over the entire range of operation, I mean by integrating it, or we also average, take the average value at the end points of the transition. So there are two methods here. One is done by integration, and second by you know taking just the average of the endpoints. So as you can also like you know understand yourself that taking the average of the uh, resistances at the endpoints that will give you a poor result or that will give you a far off result from the accurate values. However, this integration can give you some amount of equal like close to accurate values. But you know. Uh, even though this gives you close to the accurate values, doesn't give you the accurate value, and this is fine only for first order calculation or first order approximations. And you know, this is the power of, of, of the approximations that you know you can actually find out close to accurate results just by taking you know this easy procedure of taking the average or arithmetic mean of the final values of the resistance. So, how exactly we kind of found find out this equivalent resistance REQ? So REQ is nothing but the average over all the time instances of importance or of consideration, this R on T. So what is R on T? R on T is nothing but the resistance of the MOSFET, which is V by I. So what is V by I? V is VDS, I is IDS. So let's say we are considering a time range of T1 to T2. So how do we calculate REQ value? It's simply given by 1 by T2 minus T1, that is difference of the time. Then integration from T1 to T2, R on T, D2. Because R on is a function of time. That is why we are like integrating with respect to time. Now we can also change this time variable to voltage variable. Let's say here it's going from VDD to VDD by 2. So it's, it becomes T2 becomes VDD by 2, T1 becomes VDD. Here it becomes VDD to VDD by 2. And then R on TDD, it becomes VDS by IDS. And then this also, we just, uh, change this DT as DD. So this can also be transformed to variable. Like we can have a change of variable from time to voltage. For instance, here we can do that. But in general, it's given in terms of time. So it's 1 by T2 minus T1, integration of T1 to T2, VDS by IDS, DT. And it's also equivalently, like it's also like gives close to this value of half of R on at T1 plus R on at T2. This kind of approximates it, I would say, with some error which we can ignore. I mean, it gives you for first hand calculation, this works also fine. So it's simply arithmetic mean of R on at T equals to T1 and R1 at T equals to T. So now let us use this approach and then calculate the value of TPH. So here what we are interested in doing is we are trying to find out this R equivalent through which this load capacitor is discharging. So for TPH, load capacitor is going from high to low or it is being discharged through a load capacitor R equivalent. Now here also we assume a step input similar to what we have been doing till now. now Things remain same, that is just after the transition, this input becomes VOH. And you know, for T dash greater than zero and so on, since this input is VOH, our MOSFET will be traversing this curve, that is VG is equals to VOH. And M1, immediately after T dash greater than zero, what we have, we have M1 at this point two. So initially we were at point one, and now M1 is at point two. And at point two, M1 is in saturation, and VDS2 equals to VOH. Similarly, till we reach point three, which is you know half of the half of the swing away from this two point, and at point three, M1 is in linear, and this assumption, as I told, is true for you know uh, the long channel MOSFETs where VD sat is still VGS minus VT, and here at VDS three, we have the value of like we have the value of V out as 0.5 VOH plus V1, which is half swing away from this VOH equals to VT. Now let us calculate the value of R equivalent which is responsible for discharging this CL at zero plus, time equals to zero plus. So at time equals to zero plus, what is R equivalent zero plus? It's simply VDS2 
the voltage divided by the current so what is the voltage voltage is simply vds2 what is the current current is simply id2 minus this irl right so that is the current which is effectively discharging this node so what is equivalent for like resistance of that node voltage drop across that node which is vds2 divided by id2 which is the drain current which is discharging minus the current which is charging which is irl which is zero plus so we saw that you know at point 2 since this V out is close to VDD or V O H. We have this VDD minus V O H equals to zero, so I R zero plus is zero, and we have to find out you know the equivalent resistance involving this charging seal. That is what pretty much we are doing. And since this M one is in saturation, we have I D two is half K M V O H minus V T whole square, and I R zero plus is zero. So from here we can find out what we can find out R equivalent zero plus. Now the R equivalent for T equals to fifty percent. That is when the output goes by like discharges by half of its value. That is simply given by the voltage difference. That is VDS three since our MOSFET is at point three here, divided by ID three, which is kind of the current responsible for discharging, minus IR T equals fifty percent, which is the current responsible for charging this. So the equivalent discharging current is ID three minus IR T equals fifty percent. Let us look at those values. Since M one is in the linear regime, your ID three becomes K N VDS minus VT VDS three minus VDS three whole square by two. Again, by two is missing. I will change that in, in the final version. And what is IR T equals to fifty percent? It is simply VD minus VDS three divided by R. So you just plug in these values, you find out R equivalent equals to fifty percent. And as a first, as an approximation for first time calculation, we can take you know the values at this point and this point R equivalent values, and then take the mean of that. So that arithmetic mean is simply given by your R equivalent, and that is point five R equivalent at T equals to zero plus, and R equivalent when T has gone like T equals to fifty percent, that is. When output has gone down by fifty percent, or it has discharged to fifty percent of its value, and once you have found this R equivalent, which is responsible for discharging this load capacitor, our preliminary, you know, estimate simply gave us that TPHL is simply point six nine times R equivalent into CL. So using this method also, you can find out this TPHL, and this is the most common method for finding out TPHL. Now I have been telling this multiple number, like multiple times, that this is. This, like this kind of R equivalent analysis is valid for long channel MOSFETs, not for short channel MOSFETs in velocity saturation region. Why so? Because you know there is an assumption that for half V O H plus V O L, which is close to V D D by two, for an ideal inverter case, or let's say uh, when this V O L is also zero for any inverter, then this will be at half V O H plus V O L, that is half V D D. So the assumption is that half V D D at V D S equals to half V D D. Our transistor and VDS and VGS equals to VDD. So the assumption here was VDD by two or half VOH plus VOL is less than VOH minus VT. This is true only for you know long channel MOSFETs. For short channel MOSFETs, what happens? The velocity saturation is dominant, and we saw that you know velocity saturation or uh, the drain current saturates at a value VD sat which is very less as compared to VDS VGS minus VT. So in short channel MOSFETs, even your VDD by two voltage can be sufficient for the MOSFET to remain in the saturation region. So similar to this case, I mean, where the point was point three was in linear, this is not valid for long channel for for short channel MOSFETs in velocity saturation mode. So for short channel MOSFETs in velocity saturation mode, the drain voltage at which the like drain current saturates is quite small, and we saw that you know it leads to early saturation. And because of that, there were some several problems. Like you know, you had this linear dependence of the drain current on VGS. So here, what happens? Because of that early saturation due to velocity saturation thing, even for VDD by two, you can have the drain current or the transistor is in saturation region. So even at VDD by two, you can have that voltage as very greater than VDS sat. And VDS sat here is not dictated by VGS minus VT. It is dictated by VTH sat or the you know. Uh, Uh, the saturation velocity right the voltage or the electric field at which the voltage at which the electric field lateral electric field in the channel which is the critical electric field vc that def basically defines your vd sat here and not vgs minus vt so for short channel mosfets in the velocity saturation regime the mosfet may be in the saturation regime even at vgs vd is equals to vd divided by 2 so in that case Finding equivalent resistance becomes all the more easy because now there is no change in the you know uh, operating regime of the MOSFET. You can use similar expression for it. So how can you do that? 
first. You have to find out the average resistance of the device. So the formula remains the same. That is, R equivalent is simply you know going from T two minus T one and integrating T one to T two R on T D T, which is nothing but V D S T by I D T. And if you do this calculation for this velocity saturated short channel MOSFET, you will get it as one divided by V D T by two minus V D T going from V D T to V D T by two V, which is the drain voltage divided by I D SAT. Since it's already in the saturation mode, so it's I D SAT and one plus lambda V to consider channel length modulation into account. And if you solve it after multiple approximations, so this is not an easy thing to do. I definitely encourage you, and I will maybe give you an assignment also to find out by approximation the value of this integral, and you will see that it comes out as this. And what is the value of I D SAT here? So I D SAT is simply K N dash W by L V D minus V T V D SAT since your V is V D and minus V D SAT whole square by. What is VD SAT? VD SAT is not VGS minus VT. It's not VDAB minus VT. It's uh, the drain voltage at which you know the critical electric field is reached in the channel. Now this is one way. I mean, this is by performing integration. Let us look at you know how much difference we are getting when we are only looking at average of the endpoints. So once we are you know averaging the values of the resistance at the endpoints, and you know you have to simplify by Taylor expansion. Then we get R equivalent is equals to half of. So at this point, it's simply V D D divided by I D SAT one plus lambda V D D. At this point, it's simply V D D by two, which is the V D S divided by I D SAT one plus lambda V D D by two. So if you perform this analysis, I mean, if you expand it using Taylor expansion, you'll get this result. So these two results are not much different. So you can see the power of approximation. But I strongly encourage you to derive it once yourself because it's not a very easy thing. Especially this integral, it's not a very easy thing to do. You have to expand logarithm and then you can see it. So I have done it myself and I will share the solution. But in the assignment, I'll ask you to you know derive it yourself. 